This is IAQ Radio, indoor air quality radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlatan. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day, wherever you're listening from, and welcome to Indoor Air Quality Radio Plus, IAQ Radio Plus. Today is Friday, March 1st, 2019, and for episode number 536, we're going to flash back to a show we did with Dr. Richie Shoemaker, our first show with him, on April 25th of 2008. Dr. Shoemaker first joined us back in 2008, and since then we've welcomed him back seven times to update us on his research into chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Today we're going to replay that first show with Dr. Shoemaker. Richie Shoemaker, MD, is a recognized leader in patient care research and education pioneer in the field of biotoxin-related illness. While illness acquired following exposure to the interior environment of water-damaged buildings comprises the bulk of Shoemaker's daily practice, other illnesses caused by exposure to biologically produced toxins are quite similar in their final common pathway. So today's show will be the first we did with Dr. Shoemaker. I also have a, a list of other shows we've done on today's show announcements so that you can catch up, and we hope to have Richie back soon to update us once again on his current work. And before we get started, let's thank our platinum sponsor. IAQ Radio Platinum Sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. I also want to thank our gold sponsors, Particles Plus, Healthy Indoors Magazine, Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, and AEML Inc. Laboratory. And, of course, our association sponsors, the Indoor Air Quality Association and the Restoration Industry Association. Let's welcome Richie C. Shoemaker. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, and I appreciate those nice words, the introduction. First thing we wanted to do was kind of set the table a little bit here. There are a lot of industry documents, and we have a lot of people that are listeners that are practitioners of either the building sciences, uh, disaster restoration people, and indoor air quality people. A lot of them look at these different documents. And uh, one we're going to talk a little bit about is the Institute of Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, IICRC S520. They divide health effects into three categories. And I've always wanted to get a doctor to talk to me about this. They, they have category, category one, allergy, immunological, two is toxicity, and three is infection. Now, when I was doing research for this interview, a colleague commented we should probably add a fourth category. Can you add to that, or do you have any comments on how we're categorizing things? Well, there's, there's an expression to keep in mind is that we always need to challenge today's hypothesis tomorrow and reevaluate tomorrow's data the week after. And, and looking <laughs> back at, at that idea, uh, there are at least four categories of illness, uh, and, and irritation is certainly a, a, a very common problem that I see, so I agree with you. Uh, we should add an irritant uh, aspect to, to people who are made ill by exposure to water-damaged buildings, but you know, um, infection is, is hardly something I think we should lump in the water-damaged building category. I, I would tend to pull that out because most of the problems that I see with fungal infection are not really related to a water damage building per se. It's underlying host factors, uh, something wrong with a person as opposed to their exposures. So we can, we can discuss that, but in any event, it's not a large number of people compared to those who have allergy. And, and let's be specific, when we talk about immunological function, allergy is part of the immune problems of concern. And it's called the acquired immune response. And we hear about immune globulin E as a marker for that. That certainly is elevated in people with nasal allergy and asthma. Uh, and allergy to molds is, is, is something that I see every day, uh, uh, every physician does. But that does not necessarily imply the allergy is to a mold growing in a water damaged building. So we need to put a kind of an asterisk on that one. Uh, and under immunologic, if we are going to 
be breaking out into two main arms, acquired being, to say, the left arm. The right arm is innate immunity or innate immune responses. And we're going to talk a lot about that because that's my interest and uh, I think it's a huge problem. But allergy and innate immunity are separate. They're, they're, they're related. They're, they act in concert in the body, but they really are two different things. Uh, when you say toxicity, uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, it used to be that people focused primarily on uh, toxins made by fungi. And, and we know that uh, in the indoor environment of water damage building, it's a fairly unique ecological environment. And sure, you've got some interesting groupings of fungi <clears throat> making toxins they might not necessarily make outdoors. But there also you find problems with bacteria making toxins. Uh, we know that organisms that kind of in between a fungus and a bacteria, I'd call them actinomyces, also make a huge suite of toxins. And we now know that there are some uh, mycobacteria, you know, the, the group of organisms that we think about with tuberculosis, they're emerging uh, from, the, from the, the, the mud, so to speak, and we know that they make toxins that hurt us as well. So when we talk about toxins, it's a diverse group of organisms uh, that, that, that can contribute to illness acquired in the building. You know, when we talk about this lead into this question about irritation and inflammation, we really have got to put inflammation from a non-toxic aspect as a category of its own. Uh, today's science knows full well that beta-glucans hurt us. We know the mechanisms by which they can hurt us as well. We have to pay attention to little proteins that are called hemolysins that uh, also initiate inflammatory responses. Uh, golly, there, there's other proteins called proteinases, little enzymes these things make. The more you look at the, what's in the ecology of a water damaged building, the more bad players you find. So there's a great deal of overlap and, and interaction between these different uh, categories, I guess. Could you def help? I, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Schumacher, could you define for us what is a biotoxin? Sure can. When, when I talk about a biotoxin, uh, the name comes from uh, the use at the NOAA Marine Biotoxin Facility down in Charleston, South Carolina. And back when I was working with dinoflagellates, namely Fisteria and Ciguatera and uh, a few other uh, organisms with jaw-breaking names, it was clear that these very small molecular weight compounds were kind of unique in that the toxicity that they caused was due to interaction with particular kind of docking stations on cells that we call receptors. And if the receptor interacts with a toxin, a, a, a unique reaction takes place such that in, there are inflammatory substances made as that result. But the interesting feature about these small compounds is that they move from cell to cell uh, almost uh, like Casper the Ghost going through a wall. They, they have a characteristics we call, uh, they are an ionophore, and they can move through a pore in a membrane or move very quickly from one place to another, not necessarily requiring transport in blood. And indeed, you hardly ever find them in blood. That's the big problem uh, here, is that a biotoxin is not something you can rely on with a blood. So what is a biotoxin? It's a small molecular weight compound made by a living creature that initiates an inflammatory response, and it has a characteristic of being an ionophore. All right, Cliff, so you got your question answered. Let's move to the next one. That We're trying to hang in there with you. Okay, you work with patients made ill following exposure to fungi, dinoflagellates, spirochetes, AP complexins, cyanobacteria, unusual mycobacteria. What does recluse spiders have to do with that, and what kind of medical specialty do you practice? You know, uh, the, 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 I, I didn't put in lionfish and a few of the other weird ones, uh, as a whole, the organisms that I work with are some of the most primitive that you find on Earth. And, and when we look at, at cyanobacteria or blue-green algae from three billion years ago and uh, some of these spirochetes from, and fungi from a couple billion years ago and uh, worry about mycobacteria being real old-timers as well and compare them to 
the evolution of uh, animals and, and creatures that have backbones, uh, that evolution took place about 500 million years ago. And so when I look at the old-timey uh, critters, they all use the innate immune system that I look at in people. But the innate immunity is the same in these very, quote, primitive, end quote, organisms. Usually they're one cell. Uh, and that innate immunity has been kept alive in other creatures, like the spiders that make toxins, that still cause significant illness. So the concept of a toxin affecting another small organism is something we saw in primitive times and continues to this day. The interesting issue is that we all depend on innate immunity, us people and, and higher organisms, but it hasn't really changed in three billion years. What kind of specialty? Golly, I don't know. Um, <laughs> chronic inflammatory disease doesn't have a board. Uh, and this is all in her family practice. You have to know uh, genetics because it's a huge genetic component. You need to know immunology. You need to know cell biology. Uh, if, you, if it affects the lung, and it does, you need to know pulmonary. Uh, if it affects the brain, you need to know about neurology. You need to know about neuroradiology and neuropsychology to do some of the cognitive testing that we do all the time. I don't know one specialty that involves everything uh, other than family practice. And I guess you really have to stay up on the current research, as we will discuss. The problem is that the research is moving so fast. You know, they, we used to say that the half-life of medical knowledge was five years, and that if the guy's out of med school for 10 years, he's already two generations behind. I think the half-life of information in what is pertinent or relevant to the, the uh, water damage building problem is probably one year. And if, so if you're looking at literature from 2006, you're already two generations behind. Wow. I was just reading your paper from 2004, I believe. So we'll have to talk more about that one before the well, next. Yeah, uh, I mean, and, and it, so that one has brought forth a case definition of what mold illness is and talked about some of these markers of innate immunity, these regulatory hormones, MSH, and uh, markers that show changes, hyperacuity with exposure, like leptin and MNP9. And, and boy, it, when you do a PubMed search on each one of these things, uh, geez, there was only about 1,000 references to MSH in 2004, and there's 10,000 now. Wow. Well, let's, let's go back for a moment to your practice. How many patients have you seen? Well, all told, in the biotoxin arena, including all the ones we've talked about, the post Lyme syndrome and biotoxin illness from mold and, and in water damage buildings, probably a little over 7,000. And, and probably 4,800 of those, I think we're over 4,800 now, uh, are, are people made ill by exposure to water damage buildings. So it's, it's, it's a 10 year roster going on 11 year roster. Uh, and we add, you know, 5, 10, 20 patients a week, kind of depends on what all's going on. And, and we keep a database on every one of these people. So we can go back and kind of look at the evolution of thinking and knowledge uh, by what our database had. And what we did in 2001 is still true today, but boy, is it, it, it kind of looks primitive compared to what we all include now. You know, one of the things, going back to the lionfish that you mentioned, both Dr. Weil and I were old, old aquarium guys, and I guess that's probably how people were getting stung, was handling them? There's two separate uh, toxins this, this fish makes, and very interesting to me, uh, it, it, the slime has a toxin that does not act like a biotoxin, but the spines do. And the question that I had for some of the ichthyologists is whether or not there's an organism living on the spine that actually is making a different kind of toxin. I mean, the whole mechanism of ionophore toxin would suggest that you know a more primitive creature were involved. I don't have the answer to that, but it is from the spines, and and it's it's an intense inflammatory response uh, that people get. So two ways to get sick, to stay away from the spines. You know, where do you find the time with, you know, medical research moving and you're treating patients? You know, how much of your, your, your time do you actually spend 
you know, doing the research and, and writing academic papers versus treating patients? Well, my practice has changed. It used to be as a family practitioner, uh, I, I loved my rural experience, and it was pretty common to see, you know, 45 or 50 people a, a day, and it might be a 12-hour day, uh, but now I'll, I'll see maybe 10 or 12 people uh, in that same time. So I spend more time with patients, and then in between patients, uh, this is the computer age, and it, 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 it takes a very short time to do, say, a PubMed search. Uh, I work with a library that sends me reprints, and, you know, I don't know what you read when you're sitting on the commode, but I, I've got an <laughs> academic paper to read. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird life, but, you know, my, my, my daughter's graduated from college, and wife's doing her fun thing, so, you know, this, this, this is my hobby in addition to my vocation. That's great. And you got to be happy if you, you're working your hobby. What, I, uh, I agree, you know. What, what kind of, uh, you know, you do a lot of research and you write these academic papers. What, how would you describe your research approach? I think it's important to see that what I do is based on the data sets that we collect. It's nice to speculate and say, well, gee, I think, TGF data is involved with autoimmunity, but it's not until we've got a data set that shows that that I'm going to try to present that and publish it. It's one thing to have a hypothesis, but, you know, back to the, the idea of, of forensics, you know, what does the evidence show? And so everything that, that I do in my research is based on actual data generated from actual patients that I've treated. Uh, and sure, it's great to read about what other people do. That's an indicator to ask questions. Uh, but the questions have got to be answered by facts that are transparent to all. We use lab data from labs that are CLIA uh, certified. They're high complexity labs that uh, are accepted nationwide by insurance companies and all and things. So that you know, if uh, people using protocols that I use. Uh, if they send their labs, say, to a lab core request in California, they're going to get the same results that I do. So the approach is to come up with data that's reproducibly reliable that can be shared and pooled through multiple different sites simultaneously. Now, how do you go about taking this research and then applying it to, you know, your practice and, and human illness? Let me just use TGF data because that, that's kind of hot on my mind right now. I saw a large number of people. Uh, hang on one second, Doc. TGF, did you say? Transforming Growth Factor Beta. TGI. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. That's all right. We have what we call the acronym, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I should define it. Uh, forgive me. No. This compound, if you read the immunology text, there are journals these days, you, you can't pick up one journal that without seeing two or three references somewhere along to TGF beta. It's, it's huge in, in thinking about how particular lymphocytes called T regulatory lymphocytes recognize self or us as good guys and not making antibodies to our own cells or fail that task and do make antibodies against ourselves. And high TGF beta is one of the things that looks like it's involved with messing up this T lymphocyte regulatory situation, and so that if you see someone with an autoimmune problem, you can say, is TGF beta elevated? Well, looks like that is. And so I called around and found a lab that would set up a, an assay, and we sent off saved samples uh, to this lab. We have probably 20,000 samples in our freezer. Uh, they're all kept real cold and, and, and real safe. Uh, and and lo and just ask the question, do we find an association between TGF beta and autoimmunity? And lo and behold, we did. So then that's kind of looking retrospectively, taking known patients with known associations and trying to make a link. But now we collect prospectively, every person that comes will get one of these tests, and that's how we build a database so we can now begin to link, say, TGF beta to something else. And this is the same process that we followed back in 2001 when we started adding the genetic susceptibility called HLA. Here were three people sick as a dog from hysteria in 1997 out of 10 in an area. They're all exposed. They all have the same 
kinds of parameters. Nothing jumped out to separate why three got sick and seven didn't. And it wasn't until 2001 that I said, oh, boy, look at these immune response genes. I wonder if that'll tell us something. Well, lo and behold, it did. All the three that were sick had certain genes. The seven who didn't get sick didn't have those genes. So we started collecting that on everybody. Cytokines the same way. These inflammation chemicals uh, we've added along. Some of the real big, important players from complement. That's now, if I say you're you're doing a great job and you are, Joe, that's a complement with an I in the middle. Complement with an E in the middle is one of the innate immune mechanisms our body uses to hyper acutely respond to foreign invaders coming in. Started looking at complement, and lo and behold found this mother load. And so, yes, the question was based on the literature, but then the actual research is based on what do patients have. All right. Now, let me try to summarize a little bit. You've got all these primitive organisms, but they're really not so primitive after all. They use the same defense mechanisms that we use. Um, they just go around to approaching it a lot later in, or got around to approaching it a lot later in evolutionary terms. Is that a good way of summarizing this? Right. I mean, we're, humans are, and, and, and fishes and, and mammals are, are really the new guys on the block. It's fascinating that we incorporated something that worked, but we do all have it. And part of that's the innate, um, I'm sorry, I lost, I'm trying to keep track of a couple of things at once. The innate, Ability the innate to, immune response is the real old timey one. Innate immune the required response. immune response came along 500 million years ago. Gotcha. And they both are immune responses. Excellent. All right. Let me stop for a moment here. I want to see if we've got Dr. Dieter on the line. I just want to say hello because we didn't get a chance to earlier. Let's see if we have our music for the good doctor. Dr. Wow is our uh, technical director. There we go. Hello, Dieter. Are you on? Yeah. Hi there. Good uh, morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good afternoon. I tried a little bit earlier. I had some problems getting in, but everything seems to be all right. Great. Well, we'll bring you back a little later. I just wanted to say hello and see if there were any uh, quick questions you had. Well, yeah. I think I think it's 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 fascinating that we are learning something now that I think should have been obvious. I mean, decades ago. And I maybe I have a, a couple of very quick questions. I guess the, the, uh, I almost said the gene pool, but the genes uh, of a person that we are looking at, um, I guess it's probably there yeah, during conception and certainly at birth. It really doesn't change thereafter. In other words, yeah, I, I'm almost tempted to say we can, on your first birthday, the day you are born, we could take a blood sample or a biological sample and actually give you a roadmap for the rest of your life, which is you know, frightening on one hand and beautiful on the other. Um, the other thing is, and I always ask that question, did we have years ago the same incidence rate that we have today with these immunological problems in people? Or were they not diagnosed or were they ignored because, quote, we didn't know anything about it? It seems to me that I never heard so much when I grew up in Germany about people with allergies and, and, and immune problems. Okay. Let's turn Dr. Uh, Dr. Shoemaker, just for your background, Dr. Wiles, uh, Dr. in Occupational and Environmental Health, and he's a CIH who helps us on the show quite a bit. And I think he had two great questions. Would you like to take a, a stab at a response on those? I sure would. We are collecting immune response genes in people with no symptoms. And I agree absolutely that the genetic information that we have at birth is vitally important because we know that certain of these genes are associated with increased susceptibility to these inflammatory illnesses and biotoxin illnesses and other genes are not. Uh, I've also kidded around saying that we should screen school teachers who are going to be working in a building with a flat roof with water intrusion and maybe some mold growth. We would only let school teachers who are HLA-DR not susceptible work there. 
and, and, and the ACU doesn't like that very much. But the same issue is that if we put people, uh, and I often make this comment, if you've got, say, a, one particular bad one, a 4353, that person should never consider working in a moldy environment. So, I mean, we can, we can talk a lot about the genetic issues. As an aside, there are phenomena we call epigenetic phenomena as well, and that is your innate immune presentation is altered by inflammatory events that, that come later on. So some gene presentation is altered with subsequent environmental influence, such that we don't see this susceptibility to, like, say, mold illness or a water damage building illness until usually there's a measurable inflammatory illness that antedates development of problems. So I agree with you. Knowing the genes is important, and along with that, the genomics of what genes are active go hand in hand, and that's where we are right now. We feel we have a fingerprint looking at gene activation to tell us whether a person's the case of a water damage building illness or not. And maybe we'll talk some more about that. The second thing is that I do feel strongly that the organisms we see in indoor environments have been altered by chemicals that we have used, particularly fungicides. There are, uh, in fact, there's a chapter in, in, in my new book, Joe, that's gonna be talking about what started happening when we used fungicides in paint, beginning in about 1970. Did we start selecting for and transforming organisms that had genetic markers associated with toxin formation? Interesting question. It's a cinch as well that some of the newer chemicals and compounds that we find, say, in, inside the building envelope are not necessarily the same as what we had before. And then finally, you know, my interest in, in construction goes back to where I used to restore old houses and had a business doing that. The building construction techniques that I see now are quite different than what people used 200 years ago. And if you worry about an old window that's drafty, well, I'm going to turn around and say the solution to pollution is dilution. Now, I don't know if we got to the second question or not. I was uh, looking into something else. Are, are, there, are there changes in asthma and building illness? Yes. Yes. Is that a due to building techniques? Yes. Is it due to new organisms? Yes. Is it due to new chemicals? Yes. Is it due to new genes? No. You can't be any more succinct than that. Thank you. Uh, if, actually, I was just looking for some clarification for the listeners, doctor. Uh, you, you talked about fungicides, and what I'd like you to do is kind of clarify that answer. By fungicides, do you mean you know common fungicides that someone might use at home, such as Lysol or Clorox, or do you mean fungicides like you know that paint preservatives and, and so on and so forth, or both? My concern is that we are seeing. Uh, organisms that make toxins inside buildings that are now resistant to Clorox. They're resistant to quaternary ammonium compounds. Many are resistant to copper, uh, known you know, class one biocide. What do these new organisms do? Are the new organisms that survive these fungus killing compounds the same as the old one? It does not appear to me to be the same. There's another issue as well and that is some of the first fungicides used in paints, which were designed to take care of Oreobacidium puyulan, were some of the most potent mutagenic compounds in the fungus world that we've ever seen. Benamil was just simply one of those. Um, and the real issue is that we put those fungicides in paint, used them indoors, and we've altered populations uh, that are resistant to those same fungicides. And those are systemic fungicides that, that act directly impair DNA replication in particular target fungi. And the gene for that resistance is one that's passed on. So the fungicide may be long gone, but the gene that's newly created will stay. Okay, thank you. A little more, I, I want to know a little bit more about the innate immunity. Um, can you tell me a little more about why I need to know about it? Since, you know, our main interest is the health effects from exposure to an indoor environment. If you um, walk into my garage and you scrape along a board that's, that's not put away properly, 
you might scrape against the nail and the nail will make a red mark on your skin. Now, we, it might even puncture your skin, but if it just scrapes it and, and it makes a, a mark, we know that that pressure and that irritation has activated white blood cells to do certain things to react to you hyper acutely. We know pretty quickly if, if you, you know, got something wrong with you. Similarly, if we look at that skin under the microscope, we will see one chemical uh, released following the pressure that then turns on two, three, four more chemicals that attract white blood cells to the area of irritation and bring in 10 more of each so that one pathway sets off another, sets off another. And the innate immune response system acts that way when a foreign antigen gets into you. Now, if you break the skin and a piece of wood or a spore on a piece of wood get underneath your skin, there will be a different kind of response that the body has that uses the same kinds of concepts of hyperacute activation of what we call pattern recognition, where the body says something I see here is not me and I don't like it, and I'm going to send off the alarm to bring in everybody I can to attack this foreign invader. That same mechanism also applies if you breathe it in through your nose and if you breathe it in through your lungs. The body recognizes foreign antigens through very specific ways, and actually these antigens can be taken in or engulfed by particular kinds of immune cells called dendrite cells, and the dendrite cell will take it inside and begin to process it. It puts on a marker, it turns out an HLA marker, which says, you know, we can now uh, present this juicy piece of a foreign antigen to a lymphocyte that says here is something that's not right. And a lymphocyte then can present it to another lymphocyte called a B lymphocyte, which will eventually make an antibody. But the innate immunity is initial antigen recognition and then inflammation responses, cytokines and complement primarily, that then lead downstream to a later acquired immune response. The two are separate. One is right away, one's taking a longer time. Now, if it's just a matter of a splinter underneath your skin and you take the splinter out, the body will say, okay, my pattern recognition mechanism says that everything is now clear. We can all go home. The whole process of this amplifying cascade stops because the initiator's gone. But what if the individual got something in addition to the splinter and got a toxin involved? And the toxin moves outside of blood into a cell because it's ionophore and it moves from cell to cell quickly. It invariably will start to knock off or knock onto a receptor that, that recognizes it and sets off an immune response as if the body had never detected that toxin itself. And so now we almost have this stealth situation where an unrecognized invader, one for which there is not a presentation that leads to an antibody, now becomes the illness. The splinter's long gone, but what it left behind is the now source of the problem. And that's what I see in patients exposed to, say, a dinoflagellate or uh, in the uh, water damage building cohort. Did I, did I explain that well? Uh, yeah, that's that's excellent. And and I want to follow up. I, I want to go to the, the wet building. Okay, we've got this wet building. We have organisms that live there that are basically in a unique environment, okay? They aren't the same as um, – the, they're not the same way that you would find them in, for instance, a moldy pile of leaves on the front yard. They interact making extra products because of the lack of competition and presence of an abundant food – shelter, and moisture source. Um, then they make compounds, which for us become foreign substances that are antigens. You know, how, how we deal with the antigens is basically up to our genetic control over antigen presentation. I, I, is that summarizing this fairly well? Uh, I, I think you, you really nailed it properly. To me, the critical issue is that what's in a compost pile might include the same, say, aspergillus that you might find indoors. But well, that aspergillus is 
trying to survive by sending its digestive enzymes out from within inside of itself, breaking down complex parts. I mean, fungi rot things, they decompose things. And that releases you know, sugar and proteins and amino acids and things that, that would normally be bound up uh, and not available readily for the fungus to use as food. But meanwhile, there are other organisms in that compost pile that want the free sugar. They want the amino acids and the fatty acids too. So they'll try to uh, take away the food for the fungus. The fungus tries to knock off the other guys. There's your antibiotics. The other guys make compounds that slow down fungal growth, called fungistats. And basically, the energy that a fungus gets in the compost pile that it could use, say, for toxin formation or other things, is very much reduced compared to what it gets inside a building where it doesn't have the competition. You know, in, in, in a building, it needs to live. So you give it food, you give it water, you give it shelter, you get a chance to reproduce, you take away the competition, and these things thrive. So they're not the same. And all of these things impact on us because the compounds they make when they're happy, when they're wealthy with lots of food, are antigens, that some of which we process and some which we don't. Those that don't set off innate immune responses that we can measure. The innate immune responses that we see are based on gene activation. And the gene activation is something that we can measure over time. It only takes one, two, three days to show the effect of these antigens on gene activation, on protein production that we measure sequentially in blood. So I'm trying to figure out how to word this question. We, we base a lot of our indoor air quality investigations on inside and outside comparisons. Is there a fundamental flaw in trying to do that? I think so. Um, the issue that we face is that the ecology indoors is different than the ecology outdoors. And looking for a spore to tell us, as, as if total number of spores actually meant anything, eliminates all the other things that these fungi do. And, and, and there's some good work showing that for every spore that you find indoors in air, there's going to be 500 or so particles of spores floating around, and the vast majority of the inflammatory substances and toxins are found on these particles. So did you measure particles indoors versus particles outdoors? No, they're just doing a five-minute air sample. And then they're looking at organisms that are making spores and reproducing indoors as if that were the same as the organisms outdoors. Well, the species are very different. We know that as a general rule, indoors versus outdoors. And, you know, if you compare, say, the city of spores total versus outdoors versus total spores indoors, you know, it's not going to tell you. Uh, if you look at Cladosporium outdoors uh, versus Cladosporium indoors, we'd like those to be about the same. But usually it's going to be, you know, Aspergillus and Penicillium indoors versus outdoors, it tells you. It's going to be the ketomium and stacky indoors versus outdoors. The whole idea of, of a five-minute air sample ignores the ecology is what my main argument is. Okay. Well, let's, let's go back to a little more on the uh, health effects issue. And then I want to ask about the cascade of inflammatory responses. And, and if you could comment on that, that terminology right there. All right. The first mechanism that we can see following exposure of a genetically susceptible person to a water damaged building is that within four hours, the measures of a complement product called C4A go up quickly in the blood. Well, why, why, why would that be? Why is complement the first? This system is a group of 32 proteins that are preformed, ready to go, and each one of these will activate uh, its next downstream partner so that this mechanism is ready to go without any gene activation. So if genes aren't involved, and complement just requires activation of step one, two, three, that's going to be a fast-acting mover, and it is. Then we look at what happens to people who have now a toxin binding to a pattern receptor that sends a signal into the nucleus of the cell that says, make something, 
by activating a gene. Well, the time involved gets get that gene opened up, ready to be transcribed, ready to be activated, is, is, is measurable as well. It's not going to be four hours. It's longer than that. And indeed, some of the first things that we see with gene activation is products appearing in blood 12 to 24 hours. Now, we use VEGF and leptin for that. They're excellent in that regard. But these compounds require gene activation to be, uh, to be measured. They're not just there all the time in, in particular amounts. Now, that second round, after the gene fires, now the second round of compounds, if, if, if one toxin molecule set off 10 genes and 10 genes make 100 uh, products, then amplifying cascade is just that, now these 100 products go out and they each amplify and set off 100 more reactions with cells that do different things, and they will be measurable in blood after, say, 24 to 48 hours. That's where MMP9 comes in. And that acronym isn't really important. It's an inflammation marker. But then we start seeing what happens when the acute phase of day one, day two, day three uh, has been completed some of these genes now will be met with a counter-regulatory surge of protective compounds. These are called anti-inflammatory cytokines, just for the jargon. And these anti-inflammatory cytokines will try to damp off or shut down this overreactive initial inflammatory cascade. So at day four through six, we start measuring these anti-inflammatory compounds. Now here's it gets tricky. If the person has a particular history and they've been sick before, the amplification of the inflammation of the first step becomes so overwhelming that it dominates the then protective anti-inflammatory cascade. And so now a week to two weeks, you see a second surge of this additional inflammation. So we can almost take the genetics and genomics and cytokine responses of the innate immunity and mark that on a, t in a, in a timetable and say, what's happening to that individual? IAQ Radio Platinum Sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Gold sponsors are Particles Plus Engineers and Manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them at WolfSense.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at iaqa.org and RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. Okay, we're, we're going to pray just so that everybody out there knows. We're probably going to go over a couple minutes, if that's okay with you, Dr. Shoemaker, maybe 10 minutes longer than we expected. Well, you know this is my favorite topic. I've got the whole afternoon. Okay, <laughs> great. All right. Now, that's so we get our listeners um, to get an idea of how long we're going to be here. And also, Dr. Wow will be bringing him back in for the roundup. We've got a couple questions that I think are good questions that have been texted in that we'll try to get to as well. But before that, Cliff has a specific question, and then I have a couple. Right. Is fungi the most important organism in a water damage building, Dr. Shoemaker? Well, I, I wish I could give you uh, an answer with 100% surety. My answer is not 100% sure. I don't think fungi are the most important players at all. 
I did when I first got started in reading what literature is out there, there's so much that's new that says that it's products from other organisms, bacteria and actinomyces especially, and then their interaction, the so-called synergistic interaction that the researchers from Finland have taught us, I think that fungi by themselves are going to be about 10% of the problem. Okay. And the next one I had is, I'm curious about your definition or what definition you're using to tell you if a building is a water-damaged building. Uh, I think that's a pertinent uh, concept. Essentially, there's moisture in every building. I'm looking at water intrusion through the, the building envelope that is associated with amplified microbial growth. The definition of amplified microbial growth is can you smell it, can you see it, can you measure it? And each one of those three can give us the uh, requirements for amplified growth. It's not the same as, as doing a carpet sample in a room without water damage. We know we'll find fungi there, but those DNA samples are not the same, say, in the carpet of a water damage building. Okay, now I understand too, and I want to get this um, quick discussion out on the table this week, and we'll go into more detail next week, but I understand you're starting to use ERMI, the Environmental Relative Moldiness Index, as a part of your research, and I assume as a part of your practice. Can you comment on that and what the current, let's, let's look at um, how you're using it first, then I'd like to kind of go into what the shortcomings are and what you'd like to see down the road from ERMI, if we can do that kind of quickly. Sure. First of all, I have great respect for Dr. Stephen Vesper, who's been kind of the, the leader in, in bringing this, this idea to, to clinical use. The concept of measuring the DNA of fungi uh, is, is one I welcome, because I believe it to be far more accurate than, say, a five-minute air sample uh, or just a, a tape lip. It gives us a much better picture. But specifically, the differences in ecology between a water damaged building and a dry building are ones that should give us differences in population. And that's what Dr. Vesper showed early on. The drawback to me to using ERMI just for fungi is that it doesn't look at bacteria or actinomyces or other of these inflammagens that I know are players. But if ERMI is going to be an index of building health, then there should be a correlation of ERMI with sick people. And sure enough, using ERMI, understanding that it doesn't tell us about bacteria or beta-glucans or any of the others, was highly correlated with abnormalities in these particular kinds of brain scans we use called spectroscopy scans that tell us about lack of blood flow and cognitive effects. That was the first thing that we found. Um, but then more importantly, when we looked at ERMI, and we started correlating that with human factors, and C4A was the big deal, we found that for an ERMI uh, of two or higher, if your C4A is over 10,000 at baseline, and you go back into a building with an ERMI over two, you're gonna get sick, and we can measure that. If your C4A is over 20,000, and the ERMI is negative one or higher, you're gonna get sick again. So the correlation between ERMI as a building index and then some of the uh, sequential activation of innate immune elements uh, is, is quite clear and statistically it is a very low uh, p-value. Uh, does ERMI give me everything I need? No, but for a small amount of money and a very quick turnaround, I can get something that I can correlate with human health and then my human health parameters are ones that I use to tell people whether it's safe to go back into a building after remediation or to say buy a new home or a new condo. So you're using ERMI for that purpose? I use ERMI and everybody that, that will do it. It is the most useful test even in its current uh, structure. And I know that the mycologists are going to argue about what group, what organisms in group one versus group two and shouldn't we have something else. But the idea of an accurate DNA identification is spectacularly useful to me. Okay, that's a great clarification. Cliff? I was going to say, if, if I heard you correctly, you said that concentration on fungi in, in buildings 
maybe too much focus. Is there too much focus on mycotoxins as well then? I think that's, that's extremely important to emphasize. The issue is that we don't know the particular characteristics of mycotoxins that are going to hurt us versus those that are not. Fungi have the capability of altering toxins made by other fungi as well as altering their own fungi by putting a methyl group here or an acetyl group here. And that acetylation of a toxin changes the toxin from being ignored by the enzyme recognition system, the pattern recognition system that turns on C4A to one that is greased uh, to make C4A. So if I measure, say, Roradin, does that really tell me if it's been an acetylated compound or not? And so even if mycotoxins were reliable in measurements, and I don't believe that to be the case available commercially, it is the additional side chains that change how they work. It's impossible to me to look at mycotoxins as the main players when we know that fungal DNA turns on what are called toll receptors. Uh, and this is well shown for Aspergillus fumigatus. Um, toll receptors turn on cytokines like crazy. It has nothing to do with mycotoxins, but has to do with fungal DNA itself. The breakdown products uh, in fungal cell walls uh, that are, uh, again, have a, a mannose sugar side chain on them are picked up by the mannose receptor that, that stimulate innate immune responses. The beta-glucans of cell walls of particular compounds, especially galactomannan, will turn on Dectin-1 and Dectin-2 receptors, and they all turn on innate immunity. The poor toxin is sitting there struggling to get some stage time when the other heavy hitters are got a real clear mechanism for how they can hurt us. All right. I'm going to try and summarize a little bit what we've done here so far. We've, we've talked about the fact that we have some basic tools in hand now, especially that we hadn't had before. ERMI is a building health index there's a lot of discussion about um, what all we should be doing or using to test a building. We'll talk more about that. We didn't get into the um, SA2E, I believe it is, Dr. Uh, Shoemaker, uh, research model that uses repetitive exposure in a prospective study design to tell us exactly what is going on with the innate immune response in a sick person. I believe we'll have to talk more about that next week. And uh, we also have now at least some idea of what we're talking about with a water damaged building and what types of um, what types of microbes we're concerned with in these water damaged buildings. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to bring the doctor back on and do what we call the roundup. Um, Chris, do you have our our intro for Doctor Wah? <laughs> <laughs> you like that one? <laughs> well, 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 there is a a German name, Mr. Schumacher. <laughs> Right. And Dieter Weil and Beethoven, well, that's all very, very Germanic. All, anyway. All is well. <laughs> that can happen. Uh, another, another point which is kind of interesting, and I looked at those situations, and it was mentioned before, are these markers that certain people have. I work for a large chemical corporation. Joe knows that, and everybody else knows. It doesn't matter. It's the Bayer Chemical Corporation. I worked for them for 10 uh, years. And they made one of the many chemicals they made were isocyanates. Isocyanates are very reactive, small molecules, low molecular weight. And they, we know they can combine with proteins in the human body, and that's called sensitization. Now, that was, the question was, is, every, is everybody predisposed the same way, or can we get people, or can we screen people in such a way that we say, hey, look, you better don't work over there. You are predisposed. You probably will be sensitized. And we don't want that to happen. Now, you know, the more we learn, on one hand, scientifically, this is wonderful. But there are sociological problems later on. Another question, which is even more, I mean, everybody knows about. Should you let a diabetic work in a sugar factory where there is a heck of a lot of airborne sugar in the air? Probably not, <laughs> and you've got to discriminate on a, you know, on a scientific basis. It's kind of those, they, those open other doors, even though the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the science is very straightforward, the implications can be sometimes incredibly difficult. 
you can have another. Should we vaccinate everybody? Yeah. Overwhelm the uh, immune system on day one. Well, not on day one. I mean, you're one month old or something like that. It's a good question. And I, you know, I have no answers, but I, I, these are just question marks and exclamation marks. Hey, we got to watch out when we are looking at the science. Any comments, Dr. Schumacher? Well, I, I certainly have great respect for Dr. Weil. And I've heard of him, but I've not heard him in, in person. Uh, and I would love that we would have more of a chance to roundtable. The social implications stem from the interaction of environment with genetics. We can look at genetics scientifically, but the greater issue is can we control environmental exposures once we know genetic susceptibility. And, and that's where you know, we really do need to start pulling together population studies that will sort out some of the details in environmental exposure. What we look at in our study design is uh, essentially calling the indoor environment a chemical stew. We want to make the stew the same so they breathe the same stew every time they go in there, but there's no way of saying that the stew in Pocomoke is the same as stew in Germany. It's been interesting that it hasn't mattered location uh, in the United States or around the world, and I only have a few patients from Germany, but the genes of, of, of all the, the different races that I've seen are essentially the same. There's one unique, unique haplotype uh, in people from South Africa, uh, Southern Africa, I should say, that I don't see in any other populations. But if we're looking at common genetics, and we're guessing about environment, we need to put the data together to say this is what is the environment, and that's what this do, does to this genetic thing. Now, the isocyanates, the experiment in nature in Bhopal, was that isocyanates didn't kill everybody over there, but they sure hurt a lot of people. And there's likely to be difference between methyl isocyanate and butyl isocyanate. And how do we get those data if someone's going to say each of these isocyanates could be harmful? Vaccinations is a separate issue. We know that the vaccination for Lyme vaccine helped a number of people, but essentially it presented OSP-A, which was an agonist or a turner on if you will, of a TOL-2 receptor such that people with certain HLA, the 4353, had their TOL receptors go nuts. And these people got, you know, hyperacute inflammatory responses that we can measure but we couldn't stop. So that the vaccination was good for 97% of the population, 3% have got the 4353, we should never have vaccinated the 4353 people. Okay, I've got a, uh, a quick question that was texted in that kind of ties into what Dr. Wild just was talking about with uh, the diabetes. It just kind of drew my attention to it. Is, and, and it also drew my attention to a little bit in your biography. You've written a couple of books on weight gain and uh, weight loss, I guess it would be. And the question was, how is um, biotox, I'm going to refer, rephrase it, biotoxin illness related to weight gain and diabetes? Do you notice any um, relation between those? Absolutely. One of the questions we asked uh, has to do with the role of leptin. Now remember, I mentioned leptin a little too quickly. It's one of the markers that we see coming out in blood 12 to 24 hours after after this inflammatory response. Leptin is made by fat cells and it's evolved to help take fatty acids out of blood and put them in fat cells and then burn uh, fatty acids directly in fat cells themselves. Leptin also crosses the brain and turns on in the hypothalamus production of this hormone called MSH or melanocyte stimulating hormone. MSH is an anti-inflammatory good guy who regulates inflammation peripherally. So the sequence of events is that there is normal uh, link of leptin to MSH, control of body weight. Now, leptin has got to turn on its receptor, both peripherally and in the brain, to accomplish that job. Inflammatory responses, these hyperacute cytokine responses, TNF, interleukin-1-beta, coming out after exposure to a biotoxin, leads to a situation where that cytokine crosses into the brain and binds to that receptor, it's called the long isoform of the leptin receptor in the hypothalamus and blocks the effect of leptin so you don't make MSH. The fat cell 
seeing that leptin is not accomplishing what it's supposed to puts out more leptin. And we measure rising leptin hyperacutely, indicating cytokine response that's damaging its pathway. So you need to have gene transcription after a cytokine event. We're right in the time frame, remember the first day. And then later on, as an aside, we measure falling MSH as well. And then we do that as well. But basically, leptin resistance is coming from an injury to a receptor. This high leptin, what does it do? It prevents direct burning of fat, it increases storage of fatty acids, and people with unexplained weight gain, 20, 30 pounds, out of the blue as they start feeling tired and coughing in a water damaged building, that tells us clinically that's likely to be when that person is starting to get a defect of innate immune response. Now, insulin resistance is the same mechanism, a different way. That's where your type 2 diabetes comes in. That's where most of the weight problems come in. That is the cytokine injury to the insulin receptor. It's almost identical to the leptin receptor. Highly important in mold illness. Okay. The next question is just a, a quick, maybe a comment or question. Cliff, why don't you handle this one from the text message? Yeah, sure, Joe. Uh, we were texting a message that this building clearance criteria of sampling is to provide uh, relative cleanliness for the building, not necessarily provide clearance for the people to live in it. And uh, Luis, that, that's a good comment. Thanks for it. Any comment to that? We had talked about the fact that comparing inside to outside um, maybe wasn't the best thing to do, but what about on a post-remediation verification, Dr. Shoemaker? What, what do you recommend as far as the cleanliness level, or is that something we should get into in the next show? Well, let me try to be brief. I realize I talk too much. But specifically, no, you're great. <laughs> Thank you. An, an individual who has been made ill once is a different critter than an individual who's not been made ill ever. And this concept is that once primed, the innate immune responses react quicker and more severely the second and third time around. The clearance criteria for a, quote, clean building are ones that somebody should be paying the remediator to do a far more complete post-remediation sampling. To me, that's the problem, is that most people, if they've paid the remediation costs and they've gotten to their dream, they're not paying enough to do the accurate sampling of additional things that we need to know about. So ERMI helps a lot because we correlate that with C4A. Um, Ermi's got some problems with it in looking at what's in, in one, one organism in one or two. Uh, the real issue is that in any event, the way to tell for clean buildings is that it doesn't cause illness in someone made sick earlier. That's my opinion. Okay. Uh, I, I guess I'd like to comment on that and just ask you for a, an explanation. You know, you said that remediators should be paid to do a more extensive post-remediation sampling at the end. What my question is, doctor, is should we be doing remediation in a different way? You know, do you think the way that we're doing it, you know, particularly with these dry cleaning procedures and, I mean, is that good enough to, you know, remove these materials from the building? Now, uh, you, you've, you've gone beyond my, my level of expertise. I, I listen to CIHs tell me what they do. Um, there are a number of organizations that feel that fogging with particular kinds of compounds followed by cleaning afterwards is a superior method to not fogging and then cleaning. I, I haven't seen the data that would, that would say one way or another. Uh, I do know that if you're going to use a quad, for example, we ought to have some mechanism to see if the organism is resistant to it. So if you're going to use uh, some, you know, sporocidin, for example, we need to know, you know, what, what does that do to the biofilm of an organism sitting on a non-porous surface? You can't just necessarily wipe it on and wipe it off and say it's clean just because it's non-porous. These organisms live in biofilms, and they're not as easily dislodged as what we might think. I guess go back to your field and get the data. Well, I was just trying to make the comment that it would seem to me that the more thorough we can clean things, the better. And, you know, we wash our hands with soap and water. And it just seems that you know, my opinion is that a lot of these dry 
removal protocols really aren't that good. They, you can't get into cracks and crevices. You can't brush things away that, that we could wash away. And, you know, perhaps if we were using more soap and water, we wouldn't need to rely on, you know, more hazardous materials and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, I, I appreciate your answer. Okay. What I'd like to do before we go, <clears throat> we're running a little over, but I want to make sure that this week, Dr. Shoemaker, was there anything in particular this week we missed that you would like to add before we go? The words that I use are different than, say, the panic practitioner just down the street from me in Pokemon. The understanding the words takes a couple swaps. You can't just get it in, in one sitting. Uh, the jargon that I use, you can't get in one sitting. What might help is if someone wanted a copy of the Biotoxin Pathway, couldn't we just put that out on the website for you or have them email into you and get a copy of this schematic that will maybe make things a little easier because it's all on one page? Great sure. idea. Sure. We will get it up on iaqradio.com for the listeners out there, or at least we'll have a link to it on iaqradio.com. And the other question that listeners often ask, and I did see one here, was um, is there a place where they can contact you? Yeah, we have three websites, uh, chronic neurotoxins, that's N-E-U-R-O, toxins.com. Uh, it's been up since 2001. Uh, www.biotoxin.info has been up just for a year or so. Each of those has a lot of information uh, for free downloads, uh, and they're worth just kind of walking around and taking a look at. Uh, moldwarriors.com uh, is available if someone wants to read about the book Mold Warriors. Uh, hopefully the new book that's coming out called Surviving Mold will put some of the issues that I've been talking about in an easier to digest language uh, such that people can learn more of what's current in 2008. Great. And what we can do is after the show, we'll email back and forth. We'll get links to those things. We'll get them up for our listeners so that they can see that. And I think your first comment was, I know something that I will be doing and I hope a lot of the listeners will do. I will go back tomorrow. I will download this show and I will listen to it again and probably twice on this one to make sure that I understand better next week what background information you have imparted to our guests here this week so that next week we can come back with even better questions and hopefully try to help some of the folks out there that are suffering with these problems or people that are trying to help others that are suffering with these problems. So, right. And I think we'll have the opportunity to recapture. We'll go through the questions that, you know, that, that were texted in before. We're going to try to, uh, the, the wingman's going to try to capture the screen here and see if we can capture all the information that we have on the screen in terms of questions. And what we'll do is we'll try to put it all into the proper order. You know, one of the challenges that we had in taking questions is that, uh, you know, the doctor was trying to educate us starting at the basics and, and provide this basic background of knowledge and basic background of nomenclature. And if we just took questions, we would keep, you know, getting off the point. So, you know, we, we tried to do it in an organized manner. Uh, we appreciate, you know, your, your participation and hope that uh, you'll be back next week. Okay. So let me just add one more time. My email is joe.hughes at iaqtraining.com or you can email cliff at cliffzlotnick at unsmoke.com. Hughes is H-U-G-H-E-S, and Zlotnick is Z-L-O-T-N-I-K. All right, this is Radio Joe Hughes, first of all, saying thank you so much to this week's guest, Dr. Richie Shoemaker. And last but not least, our technical director, Dr. Dietrich Wow, for joining us. But most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners, thanks to all of you for joining in this week. We'll capture these questions. We'll be back with you next week at noon for the next edition of IAQ Radio. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. <laughs>